uh, from time to time with uh, uh, um, things that are things that I think there are a little bit of uh, uh, a must watch. Uh, and the first one is the computational fluid dynamics uh, lessons by Lorena Barba. Uh, uh, for, for, for those of you with, uh, with the, the open form uh, incentives, uh, there's also a CFD Python. 12 steps in Avia Stokes, uh, which could be of uh, kind of help. But this is a must. I mean, uh, this, this course is like, I mean, uh, usually, at least in my country, a CFD course is uh, for undergraduates, is like they have lectures, which they mostly don't attend. And then they use Fluent uh, to do tutorials, and Fluent tutorials are really simple. Push this, push that, do this, do that. Don't. That's not, that's not uh, how CFD is supposed to be. Uh, in this course, they, 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 they don't even do any post-processing. They just study, I mean, you know, develop the Burgess equation and and uh, code it uh, by different discretizations. Very good. Um, of course, uh, for those of you who still want to, uh, uh, I mean, uh, get in touch with a uh, software, there's, uh, there's an ANSYS course. There's also uh, a Cornell University free course that you can take. And uh, I really recommend uh, Professor Bad Bloken course. And, uh, you can find it in Coursera. Uh, it's a course about uh, uh, sports and building aerodynamics. And what's so interesting in this course is that this 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 uh, this uh, professor is simply uh, oozing with uh, enthusiasm to his uh, profession. Uh, his phenomenological uh, explanations are wonderful. Uh, I took this course. And uh, for the most more advanced guys, there's a combustion course, which is really rare from Professor Heinz Pitch, which is the world renowned in this field. Uh, I think uh, those of you who are interested to go on and do combustion, combustion is going to get really uh, in the mainstream uh, in the following year, perform large eddy simulations in combustion because uh, most of the action is away from the walls. So, uh, so here's a course, uh, learning combustion is uh, pretty hard. Then there's the, from uh, University of Kentucky, the McDonough series. Uh, I really recommend for any one of you, highly recommended reading the lectures on turbulence and turbulence modeling. Um, I mean, uh, he has kind of a point of view of a mathematician and, uh, and it's really interesting to, uh, uh, to, to, I mean, get a different point of view of all the pitfalls that uh, statistical, uh, statistical, uh, let's say, uh, statistical approach to deterministic equations like Navier Stokes uh, puts in Prince of front of us. To those of you who are interested in uh, open form, I mean, uh, I don't even need to say. Uh, Tobias uh, Holtzman just opened his new site, uh, even fixed his book with some turbulence mistakes here. Uh, then there's, uh, and then there's the mentorship, which uh, till, uh, I mean, a week from now, I will decide if I'll remove it totally, or I don't, I don't need, I don't do it financially. I mean, it's just for, uh, 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 so um, right now it's going pretty good, but it's, uh, it's actually almost free. One more. 
is the lectures from McDonough on compressible soil. No. No, he has incompressible soil uh, lectures. But uh, you can, uh, uh, if you want to learn about uh, compressible flow, I would uh, recommend, uh, first of all, you have many books about it, but uh, P.S. are good books, uh, very good, also about uh, uh, um, larger dissimulation. Uh, so uh, let's start. Let's start. Uh, Let's share a different screen right now. Share. Let's start our. Uh, we need this here. Just disturb this one. Okay. So uh, it actually had a different picture, but now. Uh, now that I have my cool logos, I'm going to use them all the time. Two more, chat. What are the assumptions while solving the bias Stokes equations? Uh, that's a weird question. So, uh, uh, the assumption is uh, uh, that uh, you are in the continuum, which means that uh, uh, there's a... Uh, 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 what's called the spectral gap between the molecular and, uh, and, the, and the, what we call infinitesimal, uh, uh, you know, derivation. Uh, and uh, that's, that's the main assumption that we use. Uh, the Navier-Stokes equations are emergent equations, what they call emergent equations. I mean, uh, they, they are statistic, they are deterministic equations, but why am I connecting to the Zoom again? Am I disconnected? We can hear. No, it's fine. Nice. Can you, but, uh, we can't Google see the here. presentation. Do you see the screen moving or? No, we see you meditating. <laughs> Is the screen moving right now? Nope. The screen. The shared screen is gone. Yeah, I know. Mm. I don't know why. Oh, I see. The internet stopped working. Okay. Now it's going to be fine. I'm going to connect to the Zoom. Okay. Okay. Screen is back, right? So then not needed. Screen is back. Yes, yes. yes, sir. Great. So uh, we're going to start. You are muted. Okay. We're going to start with a little bit of uh, with a little bit of uh, CFD modeling goals. Uh, this is uh, as simple as it gets. Results to be achieved simplifying assumptions to be made and whether they are actually can be made. This is very important. Uh, we physical models to be included in the exploration of the range of validity. Okay, we have a range of validity. Uh, can someone give an example for a range of validity that is, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, Shoot, just shoot uh, one example where you know you're out of your range of validity. An example for that is uh, trying to get um, uh, um, uh, high resolution flow with uh, Reynolds average Navier Stokes equations. 
that could be out of your range of validity. If the uh, model has, uh, you cannot uh, model uh, uh, rotating flow, uh, really rotating flow with uh, simple two equation models. Uh, regarding the above, retain and expected that case you consider in the statistical measure is cheap. Okay, we're also going to see what it means in a while. Retain how quickly the results uh, can be achieved. So this means that we, the, the, last, the last sentence is the uh, one that I want to, I want to uh, really put my, my, my finger on. Uh, we never want to start a, a project when all we think about is do we have the uh, uh, computational resources for that? Okay, so and I, and I don't mean, I mean, uh, I, I decided I want to do a DNS to an airplane. Uh, I mean, uh, simple CFD, uh, Reynolds average Navier Stokes uh, should be able, you should be able to do it with almost every geometry. Uh, if you find yourself all the time uh, fighting with uh, computational resources, uh, get a better computer. Um, and remember that all of the above uh, interact with each other. I mean, uh, simplifying assumptions to be made and whether they are actually can be made. Okay, if the simplifying assumptions cannot be made, the results will not be achieved. Uh, if uh, the physical model to be included in the exploration is not in the range of validity, then you need to use a different physical model and perhaps then you cannot uh, have enough computational resources. Uh, everything is connected here. A CFD workflow usually works like this. You define the model problem at hand according to a CFD modeling goals. You perform a pre-calculation to establish a better understanding of the phenomenology. Uh, achieving bounds, a route of, for exploration. This means that we usually don't go and simulate without thinking before that. I mean, uh, it's, uh, we're kind of, and the vendors are trying to push us also that, uh, even the, even the top notch vendors trying to push us to, uh, simulation, simulation, simulation. It, it's everything is very easy. Uh, everything is very uh, uh, immediate. And uh, no, I mean, uh, if you go to old school uh, CFD practitioners, they used to use a lot of pen and paper before doing uh, calculations. You rarely see today people use correlations or stuff like that. Uh, and that's, that, that could be a problem. Uh, simplifying the model to account for approximations and exclusive the passive features. Okay. So the first one, um, uh, sometimes I'm weary about because, uh, sometimes what you think is symmetry could not be right. And uh, furthermore, it could uh, sometimes, sometimes I mean, it could uh, really cause problems. Uh, but do exclude passive features. I mean, you don't need to have, if, if there's a, 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 a bolt insert inside a, inside, inside a hole, I mean, you don't care about the results there. There is no need to model it. You can't model it. You're just going to get a higher aspect ratio between uh, the the full domain and the and the littlest, the, the smallest uh, part of your uh, of your uh, feature. Uh, define a domain to include only physical results. Right. This is this is very important. Uh, you should look at it uh, this way. I mean, you shouldn't, you, you wouldn't like, and there uh, are uh, uh, rules of thumb, we're going to get there. You wouldn't like the numerical uh, boundaries 
to infect a uh, location where the solution counts. Okay, uh, it can become uh, very important, I mean, in large eddy simulations and stuff like that, because you need to get the right turbulence uh, content. But uh, anyway, if you have, uh, if, you, if, you, if you're solving a problem, yeah, I see the chat. Yeah. How would you go about choosing the right turbulence model for a problem that you are tackling for the first time? Oh, that, that I'm going to answer, you know, that uh, turbulence is my, uh, uh, you're, going, you're going to uh, get the essence of turbulence, I mean. Uh, I think after this one, you won't need to uh, think too much about turbulence anymore. You want to understand uh, at least about runs, everything you need to understand. But uh, very important, uh, the numerical domain. Uh, uh, if, if it's error acoustics you're doing, you, you can't have reflections from the walls. If it's... Uh, 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 if you're solving a problem of an atmospheric boundary layer, you need the atmospheric boundary layer to to uh, 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 to become an atmospheric boundary layer before it gets to your building, and uh, so you need to take this into account. This means that the domain is usually larger than you want it to be. I think your voice. Is not clear. Am I right? My voice is not clear. Is my voice not clear? No, it's clear okay, now. Fine. Yeah. Clear fine. now. Okay. Yeah. I'll hold. The, I'll hold the mic. No problem. Uh, define mesh resolution according to appropriate features. Uh, okay. Computer resources. They, they, they do. They do count. Physics, numerical description, turbulence, other physical models, prediction of high gradients, etc. Uh, this is, of course, uh, we're going to get uh, more into it in a second. Uh, still, CFD workflow, set up the solver. Uh, solver is very important. I mean, select an appropriate physical model, of course, if you need to, but if it's, if it's, if it's fluent, then, then there's a viscous button, then you choose what, whether the flow is lamina and viscid or kind of turbulence model. If you need combustion inside radiation, uh, it needs to conform with the uh, physics of the model problem. Define material properties. Uh, you need to be... Uh, usually, uh, as a suggestion, read the guidance of the specific platform. I mean, like in, in, in Fluent, you need to have uh, in a mixture of water and, and air, the water before the air, if you want to get humidity. It's uh, simple stuff that uh, can make you stuck, but uh, of course, definition of material properties is very important. Take into account that... Uh, there are simplifying assumptions that you can do. I mean, uh, solving a problem with uh, 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 natural convection uh, with uh, the full energy equation is a waste of time. Uh, there's the Bosinesque approximation, meaning uh, adding uh, 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 another term to the to the. Uh, to the, uh, let's say Z is up, to the Z uh, 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 momentum equation, and uh, you should take that into account. Don't, don't, uh, don't go uh, with the, you know, uh, 5,000 uh, kilos hammer every time. Uh, prescribe uh, operating and boundary conditions. Uh, I'm, I'm very, uh, I'm very sad to, to to notice that that many who do CFD don't even know the difference between total pressure and uh, what uh, uh, static pressure means and what uh, dynamic pressure means. Uh, but uh, uh, that's that's one thing. 
uh, not all not all uh, uh, definitions of boundary conditions uh, are the same. I mean, if you need to, you might think I I I, I define the mass flow rate in the in the or a volume flow rate in the uh, inlet, or I can the same way I know the area I know then I can define a velocity inlet. Uh, it is not the same. I mean, uh, uh, usually uh, most softwares uh, prefer to have uh, conditions like velocity inlet and pressure outlet. Uh, so it's important because they transform and uh, uh, to velocity anyway. So take this into account. Prescribe initial uh, conditions or initial values based on educated guess or previous solution. Uh, of course, if you don't have a physical solution, uh, in, there, there are many ways to initialize the uh, uh, domain. Uh, besides the boundaries, uh, we need some kind of uh, some kind of uh, uh, number in every cell. Uh, there are many kinds of uh, initializations, and uh, this could mean the, a difference between, it's not only um, will take more time, this could mean a difference between uh, uh, diverging or uh, converging. Uh, previous solutions, I mean, uh, like uh, sometimes you'd like to take a scale adaptive simulation, and use it as a basis for uh, for a large eddy simulation or uh, stuff like that. Set up the solver density or pressure based and steady or transient. Um, we'll see the difference between density or pressure based uh, solvers. Uh, there's not much difference. Uh, usually, when you need to, when you have to use density based solver. Uh, you're working with a tough problem. Choosing a solution algorithm. Uh, solution algorithm means uh, uh, usually it's supposed to uh, converge, but sometimes uh, uh, solution algorithms are like uh, coupled algorithms uh, or the uh, 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 incompressible, uh, simple, and the simple uh, family of uh, uh, algorithms. Uh, Density-based solvers have uh, also their respective solver, uh, respective algorithms, uh, and uh, um, set up spatial discretization according to the level of accuracy to be achieved in tuned solution control. Okay. Uh, there's, there's, there's many ways to uh, control the uh, uh, steps that you make besides choosing the algorithm itself. Uh, the, the, the under relaxation factors, meaning I take smaller, smaller, I take a step, but then I take a step back, okay, and I do a little step because I think uh, uh, doing uh, this big step is going to make me uh, uh, diverge. Uh, understand what it means uh, multigrid. Uh, you know, uh, these, these, not, these are not things that we are going to deal with here, but you need to understand what... Uh, uh, I mean, you can read it at McDonald's uh, PDE uh, uh, book. Uh, set up solution monitors, of course. And again, I suggest, and I, uh, I also uh, uh, provided uh, quite a, uh, I have it in my, uh, you can use it. In, you can use it for every software. Uh, set red Registers. Registers means that you register what happens in every cell, in every iteration. So if you find yourself diverging, 
uh, okay, you diverged and now everything is a mess, but then you can repeat a simulation, wait for the minute you just start to diverge and look for the problematic area. Uh, you can do that by setting registers to certain uh, uh, velocities or I don't know, whatever you think is uh, messing your solution. <clears throat> Okay, uh, compute solution iteratively solving discrete site conversions and conclusions in convention and achieved. Uh, that's a uh, little bit of uh, flux balances. Ah, okay, this, this is important. I mean, uh, especially when you solve energy related problems with radiation, uh, because radiation is like uh, solving a different problem than the CFD. Uh, and uh, you need to check flux balances. I mean, there is no way you don't have, uh, you know, you don't conform the, I mean, uh, the mass balance or the energy balance. Uh, things cannot go away. Uh, you need to check this. Uh, okay, so. Uh, Mm, this is uh, not really related to our discussion, but uh, when we have, uh, uh, usually when we use runs, when we use uh, runs, we check for integral quantities like drag or lift, or sometimes uh, mean velocity, first order statistics. But when we use the uh, larger the simulations, then uh, then it's different. I mean, uh, you need to uh, check for higher order statistics in order to know that uh, there's you're not looking at nonsense. Consider revising the model. Uh, okay. First of all, uh, sometimes checking uh, uh, different ways to, to model the same thing might, might be a good idea. Uh, usually in runs, what we do uh, is uh, uh, what is called uh, a mesh independence procedure, uh, which means that we refine the mesh and check for we, we have some kind of a, of a, a rule. Uh, I mean, uh, five percent of change is good enough for me and uh, then I can take the solution as the right solution. Uh, if you are doing large eddy simulations, this won't work because uh, usually you're already working with the most of your uh, uh, resources. So usually when uh, hybrid or, or, or uh, large eddy simulation are, are concerned, what we do is the opposite. We take the mesh, uh, we increase it by, by a factor of two, and we just check, of course, that the, 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 the results are going to be different, they're going to be less accurate, but we check to see if the phenomenology still appears. If it doesn't, it means that uh, we don't have the right resolution. Uh, Always try changing. I mean, there is, it's a good idea, but we're, we're going to see how to check uh, if our boundary layer is right or that, and this and that. But it's good. It's a good thing to to replace topologies and check uh, other topologies. I mean, uh, I can give you. I will give you some some examples that will uh, a little bit uh, uh, astound you. Uh, Okay, uh, simplification of geometry. Uh, first of all, I don't, I never recommend uh, uh, reading the directly yes. Do we have to resolve, to resolve the problem if we have applied dynamic meshing? Do you have to resolve the problem if you have dynamic meshing. You don't have to resolve the problem. Uh, 
what do you mean for mesh independence or to check mesh independence yeah i mean that, that's a, that's the problem you're solving if and I, I for example did a, a pulsating heart uh even uh yeah yes of course you do of course of course you do this because that's the problem you're solving if i'm doing a pulsating heart then the then the uh the whole mechanism is uh, like the the squeezing and uh, expanding of the heart so there's no uh there's no uh way to run away from it uh and uh of course if it's a dynamic mashing then maybe your uh results are uh correct at uh one i mean at one change of the mesh and and not in other i mean uh yeah you should solve the problem like you solve the problem i mean i i i don't see how a dynamic mesh problem cannot be dynamic mesh uh what uh, what okay thanks uh what i said is uh never never uh take uh, uh usually you can read with fluent or uh, other platforms uh, directly to space claim uh, uh solid works files uh or uh, other uh don't do that uh it's very problematic always ask the the designer to uh why am i still hot here always ask the designer to okay always ask the designer to give you an uh, xt file okay it's very important because the way he translates the problem might not be the way uh, that your uh, software translates the problem and uh, that could cause uh, real issues uh i think this is an unsolvable problem for the uh, foreseeable future how to communicate with the mechanical designers Uh, i mean they do the design uh, sometimes it's good sometimes it's bad uh you see here missing faces stuff like that most of the software today yeah it doesn't appear I found Gambit itself to be ideal for cleaning. Yeah, yeah, man. I found Gambit itself to be also. I'm, uh, I'm with Ansys before Ansys bought uh, Fluent, and I'm with Fluent before Ansys bought Fluent. And uh, but uh, well, uh, but Gambit is not supported anymore, so uh, you can't get any help for. Uh, problems that you have and you might uh, find some issues with uh I mean uh roundup errors that it makes uh so I don't know I don't know anyone who uses gambit today do you yeah I use it I don't know if you can hear me um but yeah I'm not great you still use gambit you still use gambit Well, it was it was installed on in one of our work computers um before the uh, before it stopped being supported by Ansys. So we were kind of lucky in that. Um, yeah, but but it's not supported by Ansys anymore and I, uh, yeah. I don't know. Uh, uh, so but uh, uh everything you see here is is uh, stuff that uh, most uh most platforms got uh, i mean ansys the, i think the the most brilliant thing ansys did in the past 10 years besides uh uh 
not being stupid and starting developing fluent meshing is uh, uh, buying a space claim. Right. Uh, it's uh, amazing what space claim can do. Uh, so, or yeah. Chat. How long is it with time? What's, what's the time? It's. Um, well, I don't have a watch. In your time, it's probably 8.45. And it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's 8.45. <clears throat> okay, I want to go quick through these. These, these I, I don't find them a sp space claim. I mean, overpowers them, and, and so, so does every other software today. Uh, uh, simplifying geometry became really easy. Uh, and also there's a fault tolerance, uh, every, every vendor has its own false tolerance. Uh, Rajat, you told me you started to learn the false tolerance. Uh, yeah, so, so you get a crappy geometry and then uh, it overcomes it. Uh, flow and mesh workflow. To, I don't want to talk about flow and mesh separately. I don't think it's uh, it's uh, it's part of the best practice guideline. Um, okay, what do we care about uh, when we talk about meshing? And, and then I'm going to uh, uh, stop this uh, 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 presentation for a minute and move to uh, one of my posts. Uh, accuracy, desired mesh quality, uh, maximum, maximum skewness in the case of, uh, was, was actually more in the case of Tetra. Uh, now, mostly when you use polyhedras, uh, it's uh, the orthogonality that you need to check because the polyhedra is a little bit harder to get skewed, but... An aspect ratio, uh, usually you have to tolerate it. I mean, in the boundary layer, you'll have a huge aspect ratio sometimes. Uh, efficiency, desired cell count, yes. I think ISEN still lacks a lot of, still lacks a lot of Gambit tag to primitive face smash. What do you mean? Um, I think I was just responding to uh, someone else what they said, but I remember um, I was looking for something to do in Gambit. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 ISEM is great, but in uh, Gambit is great, but uh, producing a mesh with with fluid meshing or with point wise uh, with with respect, especially with complex geometries, uh, then to do that same with ISEM could be really exhaustive and uh, one of the one of the uh, one of the uh, expectations from NASA was to take the man out of the loop I mean uh, yeah. uh, a CFD practitioner should only check the post processing he shouldn't be messing with uh, structured uh, uh, hard to define mesh uh, I mean some of you, I mean, maybe are uh, using ISEM so much that, that they feel like it's uh, the easiest thing to do. Cut here, cut there, cut here, cut there. But, uh, but uh, it's really not that uh, uh, efficient to work with complex geometries and uh, measures like mesh generators like Gambit or... I agree. Uh, Hypermesh, I don't like this company. Don't like them. I hate them. I was supposed to get, uh, I was interviewed to get a local uh, uh, manager in Israel, and uh, they told me the job is yours, and I was kind of happy back then. Pointwise is more effective than fluent meshing, right? Pointwise is uh, awesome. I mean, 
which was uh, nothing compares to what they do in point wise. Uh, but fluent meshing is, I, I don't know about efficiency. I mean, if, if fluent meshing is really easy to use. They have this workflow now, but the workflow is still very uh, limited. I mean, uh, uh, five years ago, uh, when you were working with the, not with the workflow, uh, you had to have some expert with you to teach you how to uh, do stuff. Because it was really hard. You needed to be an expert to produce a mesh. Then they went to the workflow and it became really easy. But uh, there is a lot of stuff you can do with the workflow, like uh, having different kind of uh, inflations, uh, boundary layers, types, or uh, it's still, it's not there. The, the, the ANSYS decided for some odd reason that what they want to do is make, uh, yeah, workflow is awesome. Yeah, it's awesome, but uh, it's uh, very limited. Uh, I mean, uh, if you decide to, uh, go on with smooth transition, then you'll have to do smooth transition everywhere uh, in the inflation. And uh, that's uh, kind of uh, problematic. You have less control over the, the, the stuff that you... Yes. Yes, but then, but, 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 then, but then you have other stuff that you have to define, like uh, if you're going to do stair-stepping or you're going to do this or you're going to do that. I mean, uh, they, they, they made a big mistake. They've decided that the mechanical mesh is going to be the mesh for everything. Uh, and the mechanical mesh is horrible for CFD. I mean, you simply... It's, it was simply horrible. And uh, so they got uh, like uh, retarded for a few years. Yeah, remember that you have to pay for point wise after a month, I think. Of course. So it's good to start to learn. You have to pay. You have to pay for every software, don't you? Uh, Okay, so uh, desired mesh quality. Mesh quality is very important, especially in the boundary layer, uh, but not only in the boundary layer. Uh, we'll see some meshes that uh, would astound you that uh, are better for some kind of applications than others. But especially in the boundary layer, we want our uh, inflation, or uh, let's say I call it the uh, orthogonal layers, uh, to, uh, the, 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 the prism layers that are orthogonal to the uh, uh, gradient uh, of the flow. Uh, you want it to be as, uh, as, as uh, I mean, as best as you can, because otherwise you'll get a big truncation error and uh, it's, uh, it's going to mess up your results. Uh, accuracy, efficiency, desired cell count, low cell count, low cell count for resolving overall features versus high cell count for greater details. Well, that, that's of course uh, right. Uh, don't ever, we all know, I don't think there's anyone here who will uh, disagree. Uh, CFD resources can get, uh, can always get out of hand, uh, even with uh, Reynolds average not the stokes. Easiness to generate faster tight dominant mesh versus created hex hybrid. That's all the stuff. And you now mostly they're doing, uh, I think, uh, polyhex core uh, or poly. If, if, if you know when, when, when it's better to do polyhex core and when, it's, uh, when, when to do a poly mesh 
or when to do a hack smash. I mean, a hack smash, uh, which is a body feed that you can only do with Isen, of course, but it's going to be very hard. Uh, poly mesh is, uh, is very good. You get prism, of course, in the uh, inflation, in the boundary layer, and then you get some, uh, some, uh, uh, and then the rest of them is just polyhedral. And then you have polyhex core, which means you have uh, two layers connecting the boundary layer with the uh, uh, polyhedras which are not uh, prism to the uh, hex core. And the hex core is simply a cut cell. I mean, it doesn't have, uh, it's not body fitted. So if you have uh, uh, like uh, curved flow, uh, you have like uh, swirling flow, then using hex core is not so good because then you, you don't get anything from using hex core. It's like using Tetra. And uh, polyhex, when you use polyhedras, you have uh, more chance of having, uh, uh, of decreasing the truncation error because it can set better to uh, 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 right. So we got, we're going to see a, a, a specific uh, uh, Example for that. Okay, skewness. Everybody knows what skewness is. Skewed cell. We want uh, our skewness to be lower than uh, uh, 0.7 usually in the surface mesh. Uh, in order for it to be under 0.9. The, yeah. Anyway. What are you chatting about? What kind of mm, we should consider as good mesh quality and should proceed for... Okay, so I'm, now, I'm going to say it now. Uh, for skewness, 0.9, you can continue forward. Uh, if it's a dynamic mesh problem, you should be a little bit uh, less, uh, a little bit more conservative because uh, the dynamic mesh might... Uh, uh, quickly uh, diminish the, the quality. So you'd need probably to start with a better, uh, uh, with better than 0.9, I mean. But uh, the same with uh, aspect ratio. Aspect ratio usually doesn't mean too much uh, because, of course, you're going to get high aspect ratio inside the boundary layer. Uh, it's not so good to have uh, a high aspect ratio. I mean, with like some smoothness in the in the flow. So, so having cells inside like a jet with high aspect ratio is. Uh, is, uh, doesn't make sense, and, and, and it's also not going to happen. Uh, you see here, hack smash versus uh, versus uh, 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 three tetrahedral mesh, and uh, what you're supposed to see is that uh, when the flow is aligned with the uh, cell. Uh, surface, then uh, it makes a difference that you use a uh, hex mesh over a, a tetrahedral mesh. When the flow does not, you see that the results are kind of the same. Okay? So that's why uh, when the flow is uh, uh, curvy and uh, very sophisticated, uh, uh, turns and revolutes, then it's you'd rather use polyhedra. I mean, if I had uh, like a like a helicopter, then usually what I do is use uh, an inner mesh where the flow is really uh, with large rotation with polyhedra and uh, and polyhex core only outside. So I'll split the mesh and you know connect it or something like that. Uh, but uh, the larger the, larger the uh, 
the the larger the angle is from the you know the orientation of the flow to the cell uh, to the cell uh, uh, front then the truncation error is going to be bigger and uh, that's uh, always like that this one i've added today uh, i think many of you don't consider when you uh, uh, that's what I actually uh, the difference between defining different uh, methodologies of inflation I mean every kind of inflation besides being able to if the, the geometry is very uh, uh, sophisticated and, and you know you need the corners to connect with boundary layers and and stair stepping, and it's hard. And sometimes you can't use a specific one than another one. Yeah. No, we're going to talk about numerical diffusion. We're going to see numerical diffusion. We're going to see it big time. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, not only numerical uh, diffusion, also dispersion. Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, there are different ways to. Uh, of course, you have uh, a few, uh, a few uh, uh, parameters. You play with two, you get the third one. Uh, there is. It's entered. There is no, uh, if, if there, I mean, there is no sense to use a uniform mesh if the boundary layer changes uh, enormously. Uh, the same could be, you should check the mesh and we'll see how we check the mesh. Um, but uh, here you can see the difference between the, these are specific to, to uh, 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 fluent, but I can invent mil a million kinds of. Uh, uh, I mean, I can go with a first cell and grows. I can go with, but each of them are going to give me something else uh, uh, along the flow, and you need to consider that because uh, once you do not cover the boundary layer and all with the right resolution, then uh, your uh, uh, error will be large, okay? Uh, so, okay, the difference between pressure-based solvers and density solvers is uh, quite known. Uh, usually we solve, uh, we solve, we, you, we usually use density-based solvers today mostly for problems which are high Mach, uh, very high Mach, and these are problematic problems. Uh, Pressure-based solver could be used uh, uh, even till, uh, I don't know, Mach 3, I think. Uh, you have the segregated solvers, which means the simple kind of of solvers and you have the coupled okay um, otherwise it's quite the same I mean uh, this, uh, the only difference is in the, the density based uh, uh, method you of course uh, solve the uh, all the species energy momentum uh, mass of everything inside one uh, together because you have the uh, you have the uh, you know thermodynamics to solve and then you go and solve the turbulence equations here you first solve the momentum and uh, continuity solve mass momentum but you do also uh, uh, repeat I mean every iteration back this loop Okay, so, yes.
No, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't recommend using density-based uh, solvers uh, for no reason. Uh, Pressure-based uh, uh, solvers are a lot more robust. Um, there is no reason to choose a density-based solvers for a problem which doesn't need to do anything specific with the thermodynamics of the flow inside. I mean, in a very high mark, you could get uh, a phenomenon like uh, the chemistry changing, okay? Uh, the, 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 so uh, there's no, there's no uh, way to uh, uh, not use uh, density-based solvers. But uh, usually we prefer to use a uh, pressure-based solver for uh, most of the problems. Uh, I don't remember. Okay, pressure-based solver, as I said, you can use them. Uh, it, uh, for, traditionally, it was for incompressible flows, but you can use them to do the three masks. Uh, Density-based solver normally used only for higher mass numbers and for capturing and uh, interacting shock. But uh, again, writing such a sentence is very uh, uh, funny. I mean, like uh, boundary layer shock interaction is a problem which is not quite solved yet. Uh, Pressure-based segregated projection uh, algorithm. Uh, you have my post about the uh, projection method. Uh, simple, simple corrected, piezo, uh, maybe control to stabilize convergence through under relaxation factors. Uh, again, so, did anyone not understand what under relaxation factor is? It's like uh, uh, taking, uh, I have like uh, uh, to walk from the beginning of the room to the end of the room. And uh, instead of taking 10 steps, every step I take uh, half a step, okay? I just use little steps. And uh, sometimes this, uh, 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 sometimes it helps with, uh, uh, but then it takes a lot more time to converge. Uh, yeah, again. Okay. Taking, uh, taking in mind that this should in turn decelerate the convergent process. Pressure-based coupled algorithm may be controlled by stabilization of the current number. Uh, uh, today, uh, I think uh, the influence specifically is uh, using the, uh, how is it called? The, it's not using the coupled, right? It's using uh, the, never mind. Uh, yeah, but it doesn't have the current as a default. It, 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 it has a time, it, it has a time scale. Yeah, uh, but I, 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 for a long time, I prefer to work with the Quran, but it doesn't matter. I mean, uh, it's the same, it, it serves the same as the under relaxation factors. Uh, uh, better stabilization um, of the pressure based cover can be achieved by pseudo transient option, of course. Um, this doesn't matter. Pressure based solver. Okay, now there is, <laughs> it says here uh, a couple takes 120 iterations and simple takes. Not really. I mean, uh, sometimes it could be the other way around. Sometimes one cannot converge and the other can. And uh, there is no really uh, saying that uh, simple is uh, slower than coupled, uh, but uh, sure. Uh, the density-based sulfur is applicable when there's uh, 
strong coupling. I mean, when there's a thermodynamic issue, uh, a hard thermodynamic issue, uh, maybe shock boundary layer interaction or uh, high Mach flow where the uh, chemistry changes and you need to solve all of this together. Uh, there are explicit methods, implicit methods. Uh, everybody knows the difference between explicit and implicit. Um, the density based solver may be explicit, explicit method calculates the state of the system for later time, but it's, it's a little bit faster. Uh, the difference is that uh, uh, explicit, uh, usually explicit solvers are uh, uh, very sensitive to uh, the CS felt condition. Uh, which is like the uh, size, uh, the, some kind of measure of the size of the cell and the time it takes the uh, phenomena to pass the cell. Uh, and uh, so usually in explicit, you take smaller time steps. Uh, but uh, we're not going to get so inside this. So... Uh, inside the stuff here. Yeah. Okay, this I was thinking if uh, I should talk about. Uh, I think it's a little bit uh, too, uh, uh, but it's important to uh, realize here you see the Burgers equation. The Burgers equation is a, a, a 1D equation, non-linear. It could be linear. In this case, it's a linear equation. And uh, uh, you see here expanding over u minus one and uh, to a Taylor series, okay? Then uh, you get some kind of uh, uh, equation which is called a modified equation. You choose the accuracy and then you have uh, kind of the uh, an effective Reynolds that you uh, it could be it could present also the Reynolds cell problem. But what I wanted to talk about here is uh, a numerical dissipation and numerical uh, dispersion. Uh, usually, uh, uh, the higher uh, the order of the truncation, that the higher the order of the uh, uh, Discretization we take, uh, the lower the, uh, the truncation error is, of course. Uh, usually, the, the uh, even order derivatives are the ones who are controlling the numerical dissipation, which means the smearing of the solution, like you saw in the hex mesh uh, when. Uh, when the flow wasn't aligned with the cell, uh, that's a truncation error, which is numerical dissipation. And the odd uh, order derivatives cause uh, numerical dispersion, which is like uh, wiggles in the solution. Most softwares don't use anything, uh, uh, I mean, uh, unless they are in house. Uh, then second order uh, uh, discretizations. So uh, um, you should expect uh, uh, the dispersive and uh, especially the uh, numerical dissipation every time when the uh, flow is not aligned with the, uh, is not orthogonal to the cell uh, phase. Uh, every time, every uh, in every location that it happens, this is a location where that truncation error adds up. Okay, that's uh, that's something that should be known. Uh, here you see it again: effect of discretization. Uh, if, if you have uh, uh, said before. Yeah. First of all, the upwind is uh, usually we, when we uh, uh, we usually uh, 
called the stimulation with first order aquin because it's a very dissipative uh, uh, scheme. Uh, what's good about it is that it allows us to get a uh, uh, very uh, dissipative scheme, but but uh, get closer to the solution. First order upwind will not be uh, tolerated in any uh, publication. I mean, uh, you cannot even uh, offer a publication when you do the CFD with the first order uh, 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 scheme. Uh, the second order upwind scheme uh, and the whole idea of upwind is that we get our data from the uh, uh, you know uh, the the the, uh, the upstream. So that's uh, a little. That's what Patanka thought, thought makes uh, more sense. Uh, that was his uh, incentive for going for the second order upwind. Uh, it has a condition. It has some kind of condition uh, uh, limiter in there. But uh, usually, why is it like that? But usually it uh, doesn't, uh, uh, the quick scheme, um, as, far as, I know, if, if, as far as I know, does not improve anything to the second order uh, upwind scheme. Uh, in, only in certain cases where the flow is really aligned with the cell. Uh, uh, same, same is with the muscle uh, scheme. Yes. The solution is smeared across the cell faces. What does dissipative scheme physically mean? A dissipative scheme means that we cut the, if it's first order, then we cut the second order, uh, uh, from the, uh, from our, uh, uh, let's see here. It means that we throw uh, from our uh, uh, Taylor uh, uh, the, the, the second derivative. If we throw the second derivative, uh, we said uh, the, the, that the, uh, 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 even derivatives are in charge of this, of uh, 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 dissipation, numerical dissipation, and uh, the are derivatives of on the on the dispersion error, numerical dispersion. Then, if we use first order, it means we threw the second order uh, uh, from the Taylor. Uh, from the Taylor uh, uh, expansion, then we get a large uh, dissipation uh, uh, dissipation error, miracle dissipation. It's like a, a it's like, and you see it here. Um, I don't think it's really but but it's it's like an, an another. You see it here. It's like another object that that joins the dissipation okay uh, i see okay time dependent problems uh if we use uh it's usually uh as I said before, uh, the characteristic flow velocity times delta t, typical size cell. It, it's uh, usually uh, better uh, described as the time it takes the phenomena to pass that uh, cell. Okay, and uh, uh, in explicit uh, uh, schemes, uh, the, there is a really uh, harsh current, uh, it's, it's a lot sensitive to the current number. Uh, in, in implicit schemes, it usually, it can be unconditionally stable, but if the current number is such that, I mean, uh, uh, the, the cells are such that the phenomena 
goes too fast through the cells, I mean, the cells are too, uh, 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 not, not refined enough, you just get a big error, okay? So you won't get a divergence, but you get an error. Here you have some uh, estimations you can get, uh, they, they, they actually work, I, I use them. Uh, I use this one for, uh, for a turbo machinery application of, uh, of uh, 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 like a rotor that you put inside a, a blood vein. And uh, yes. Smear the cross surfaces for explicit message see if it should be under one, correct? Um, it depends what you call... Uh, it should be under one for a final difference uh, scheme in, uh, where everything is uh, the same size. But uh, usually what it means is that uh, phenomena cannot uh, go faster than the typical uh, cell size. I mean, uh, that's it. Uh, so you have some kind of, uh, uh, I mean, you know, uh, ways how to choose the delta T for certain, uh, but this is more about... Uh, uh, this is less about uh, convergence. It's more about uh, what you see here is more about uh, estimation of a time step to generic problems. Okay, it's not about uh, current. It has nothing to do with current number. Okay, uh, this this is time dependent problems. Uh, uh, Mission condition is critically important, of course. Uh, you can run the solution a little bit, I mean, uh, until you get uh, a realizable solution, or you can run a steady state uh, before that. We do that uh, like in, with uh, the with, uh, very known von Karman problem. Uh, we want to run a steady state uh, simulation, of course, it's dependent upon the uh, food not for, uh, frequency, but uh, we still run a uh, uh, steady state problem before that and then uh, move to uh, uh, transit problem. Avoid using results from the few time steps before settling trend to residual receiving. So this is, of course, uh, right. Uh, okay, the number of iterations, uh, usually you'd prefer not to make too many iterations inside the time step, you'd rather lower the time step, okay? Uh, understood? I mean, uh, here it says 20, 20 is kind of, a, uh, it's, it's, it's not a, it's a rule of thumb, but you should not run 100 iterations per time step. Uh, if you have this kind of problem, then uh, just lower this time, uh, lower the time step, and uh, uh, that's what you should do. Uh, reduce time step to achieve better conditions instead of increasing the not. Okay, that's what I just said. Mm -hmm. um, for pressure-based solvers. It does not include the radiation, blah, 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 blah. Conversion might highly, highly Oh, this Anita algorithm. Uh, what it does, it's uh, it skips some some of the steps when when some of the uh, parts of the pressure based solver converges, then it doesn't uh, uh, touches them more. It's just uh, you can use that. Mm, don't know. Uh, here is uh, a little bit uh, something that is not related to what we're talking about right now, but uh, usually when we uh, when we have uh, 
uh, when we were using uh, Reynolds average Navier Stokes equation, uh, we wouldn't get more than uh, uh, first order statistics. Okay? But that's what we get, I mean, the mean velocity. Uh, we can calculate uh, integral quantities like the integral of the pressure distribution over the wing, but uh, we don't get second order statistics or PSD or because we don't have to any turbulent content. <clears throat> okay, we're gonna focus on uh, uh, runs here. Uh, we're going to focus on runs. When we talk about uh, Reynolds average Navier Stokes equations, it means we split the uh, velocity to uh, an average velocity and a perturbative velocity. Okay? Then we do an ensemble average. Usually it's, it's called state time or ensemble average, but. Oh. The, there's no, there's no from yeah. someone. There is some noise from someone. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, we should be fine. Yeah. Yes, so uh, usually... Uh, yes. Okay, so we do uh, the composition to uh, uh, an average velocity and a perturbative velocity. Uh, it's written here time or ensemble average, but if we want to get uh, uh, the UDT, then we obviously must have an ensemble average. An ensemble average means that like, it's like taking uh, many experiments and then doing an average, okay, instead of uh, doing a time average. Because if we do a time average, then there is no uh, uh, time in the equation. Uh, what we get is the same equations as the Navier-Stokes equations, but we get another uh, another uh, term here. Uh, what's interesting, um, and I bet no one has told you that, that this term here actually arrived from the nonlinear term, from the advective term. So it's a little bit weird that we have a uh, uh, stress term. So what this actually means that uh, uh, Reynolds average and Navier-Stokes equations are a little bit dissipative. Okay, they take a convective term and they turn it to uh, uh, especially when we uh, invoke the Buzinesk uh, uh, hypothesis, we turn it into a, a, a dissipative term. So this is, of course, a symmetric tensor. Yes. Can you repeat the ensemble average, what ensemble average is? Ensemble average, it is not time-based, no. It's like taking an experiment and then repeating it over and over and over and over and over and over and getting a result every time and then dividing by the number of times you took the, the, the uh, experiment instead of just making one experiment and then uh, doing the time average of it. Okay? It's very important because uh, otherwise you cannot do uh, can you, it. No one asked question? It's not. Okay. Uh, different turbulence models. What you see here is, the, is essentially the Buzinesk hypothesis. 
Po Bozineski Patisif i Edi Viscosity uh, model, uh, there are Edi Viscosity models, there are non-Edi Viscosity models. Uh, non-Edi Viscosity models is where we don't use the Bozineski Patisif. The Bozineski Patisif ties between the, the uh, uh, Reynolds stress and the uh, gradient of the uh, uh, of the average flow velocity, okay? Uh, so, non eddy viscosity models are like uh, Reynolds stress models, okay? It's written here, Buzinesk approximation, but it's, it's Buzinesk hypothesis. Buzinesk approximation is a uh, different whole different thing it's the, what we talked about with the uh, buoyancy okay so there can be uh, what we see here uh, is a linear relationship a linear eddy viscosity model uh, it's important i'm going to see uh, i'm going to show you uh, an example for uh, uh, other eddy viscosity models which are nonlinear. <clears throat> okay, modeling of turbulence, Reynolds average. Uh, the, there is actually, we connected here, uh, the eddy viscosity is a, 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 a feature of the flow, not the feature of the fluid, okay? Instead, unlike the dynamic viscosity, okay? And uh, by dimensional analysis, you could you just simply have to have a length scale and a time scale, or a length scale and a velocity scale. Uh, here you can look at uh, uh, your, the choice is L is a length scale and a time scale. It could be a kin the turbulent kinetic energy and the dis its dissipation or the turbulent kinetic energy and the specific dissipation, it doesn't matter. But if we have two equation models, then uh, we call it uh, uh, closed. Why? Because we don't have to guess any... Uh, the, 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 in the past, they were using uh, a mixing length models, one equation models, in each of them, you had to uh, somewhat guess and then uh, calibrate the model per area for, uh, for some length scale. Here you have two transport equations. Transport equations means you have an advective term, a convective term, a production term, a dissipation term, uh, two, two PDEs for each of those uh, uh, dimensions you choose, and you can choose whatever you want. Uh, one turbulent scale, usually they choose the kinetic energy, which is provided from the solution of the transport equation. The second scale, this is uh, really not, uh, uh, doesn't matter. Invoking the Reynolds decomposition, performing manipulations. What you see here is not the, uh, is not the exact kinetic energy, turbulent kinetic energy equations, okay? We can derive it. It's easy to get the kinetic energy. You just multiply the uh, velocity. Uh, I mean, if it's specific uh, energy, then just multiply by a perturbative velocity. Uh, but what we do is usually we, after we uh, do the, the, the whole, it's not a turbulence course, but what, if we do, after we do the whole uh, uh, decomposition, we get a lot of uh, terms which are uh, uh, like uh, triple correlations between uh, perturbative velocities. What we want to get is not to have any perturbative velocity in the equation. So here you can see the gradient assumption, uh, different assumptions, okay? Uh, this, is, this, is, this requires ad hoc uh, assumptions. I mean, uh, this is not an exact equation, and this is very important to note. 
Okay, how we get the epsilon equation? Usually, we can get the epsilon equation by uh, deriving it from the Navier-Stokes equation, although it's very complex. So what we do actually is simply uh, use an analogy to the to the kinetic energy equation. We uh, multiply each term by epsilon over k and add a specific uh, empirical constant because we don't know what the ratio really is. And we get another equation for this time for the epsilon as uh, the dissipation. So that's the derivation of uh, K epsilon model for the same choice. <coughs> now, uh, most of you know uh, and use either the K epsilon equation or the K omega equation, right? And now we're going to see the difference between the K epsilon and the uh, K omega. The K epsilon has two problems. First of all, uh, the epsilon equation cannot be integrated through the viscous sublayer. What is the viscous sublayer? I have to go for this to here. Sure. I'm trying to find uh Okay, I did it before, but now I think I still need to do it again. Uh, where is the law of the world? Here it is. Open a new tab. Okay. Here is the law of the world. Okay. The boundary layer, uh, the turbulent boundary layer, uh, unlike the The turbulent boundary layer, unlike the uh, uh, laminar boundary layer, which is uh, parabolic for the case of, uh, uh, let's say, a pipe or uh, uh, a fl or uh, uh, channel flow, uh, is comprised of uh, a few different matching zones. These zones are matched by perturbation analysis. You see there is no real match here. But uh, we usually look usually take regards to the viscous sublayer, which is a linear layer, sometimes called also the laminar layer. Okay. This is a logarithmic uh, graph. The y plus is the distance is a universal distance from the wall. We can, from every y plus, calculate a uh, physical y, okay? Which means that we need to place the first cell away from the wall in this physical y. Uh, but it looks like this. We have the viscous sublayer. We have a connecting layer here, which we don't regard. It's called the buffer layer. And then there is the log layer. What you can see is that, uh, uh, as I said, the epsilon equation cannot be integrated to the world. It cannot get a Dirichlet uh, boundary condition, which means that uh, it needs to, if we have to, uh, cal if we have some calculation which needs, uh, which which the physics effects are important, like drag or like uh, uh, thermal uh, issues, uh, we need to use some kind of wall treatment. That's why you'd always see in the K-Epsilon uh, many wall treatments. We're going to see them uh, afterwards. And uh, the initial range we see starts at Y plus 30, but it doesn't end. It doesn't have a defined ending. Uh, the larger the Reynolds number is, the larger the, the ending of the uh, log layer is. But we still have to maintain the, the right resolution, okay? 
So if we have a low Reynolds, maybe uh, the, the log, log logarithm, the inertial sublayer or the log layer ends at uh, y plus equals 400. So, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. So it's very important to note it does, and it's, it's uh, uh, crucial actually. <clears throat> okay. So best practice for years. Let's go back to the screen sharing. I'm not quite done with that. I want to. I want you to understand exactly what is the difference between the models you use, okay? So the epsilon has its problem. It cannot be integrated to the wall. It needs wall treatment. Wall treatment means either we use wall functions. We have, have, we have some types of wall functions, but this means we have no, not, we don't have a no, uh, non-slip condition. We use some kind of velocity away from the wall, okay? Or uh, we use uh, what's called the low Reynolds model, which uh, in the past was uh, based, on, it's still based on the Van Riest uh, uh, damping functions. And uh, uh, the problem with them is that they're nonlinear and uh, stiff. So uh, it's not an ideal model. It's called a wall sensitive model. Uh, this model, the, the most known model, and it's the most important model, and it's, I still think it's the most important model by Jones and Lander uh, at 1972, was uh, derived. Uh, after that, Will, Wilcox uh, took and uh, derived the K omega model. But the K omega model, which uh, uh, Wilcox derived, had a, uh, it could be uh, uh, integrated all the way through the wall. It was not wall uh, sensitive; it was wall insensitive. But it has it, it had a strong dependency on the free stream values from the inlet. Okay, it means that uh, the change, little changes in the inlet could make a 20 percent difference in the uh, eddy viscosity ca calculated in the omega but eventually in the eddy viscosity calculated uh, to alleviate this uh, shortcoming uh, what Menta did in 1992 uh, while on nasa it was not in uh, answers yet uh, he took the k epsilon near wall behavior uh, uh he took the actually both of the models and joined them together but solving only a k omega model meaning he transformed the k epsilon to a k omega okay it's really easy you can take a substantial der der derivative here get uh, 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 omega from epsilon okay so what he got instead of the uh, 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 k omega of Wilcox, he got another term here, which is uh, a kind of a cross diffusion term, which most of the time is is doesn't do anything, but it has a tremendous effect near the end of the boundary layer. So by that, he solved the problem of uh, the uh, uh, omega getting, uh, being very sensitive to uh, free stream values. But the other problem that the K epsilon has is it's, uh, uh, it was found to uh, not delay, delay separation. I mean, separation was found delayed uh, whenever you use the K-Epsilon model. And this remained here. It, it, there is no difference. I mean, it remained here. So for that, in the same, uh, the same year, it, it's actually the same uh, publication when he derived the BSL model. 
He also derived the shear stress mode. Uh, shear stress model. Uh, the shear stress model is based on, uh, if we look in, on any uh, two equation model, uh, we have this connection between the, this relation between the, uh, between the shear and the production of kinetic energy and uh, its dissipation. Usually it's one. But uh, when there's an adverse pressure gradient, I mean a pressure gradient, a negative pressure gradient, then it's bigger than one. And when it's bigger than one, uh, we get uh, no separation or delayed separation, sometimes even no separation. What he proposed is using uh, the bridge or hypothesis. Uh, and by that, he simply solved the, the problem of uh, he, he, he claimed to have solved the problem of uh, delayed separation. But essentially, the publication of Menta was about aerodynamic flows. Uh, aerodynamic flows of uh, the regular type. And uh, sometimes uh, you can see that this A1 here, uh, uh, it is too rough in the case of the SSD. So uh, it, it, it really does work better for aerodynamic flows. That was the name of the publication. But it could be not uh, better than the, I don't know, realizable K uh, epsilon or uh, the BSL for the uh, uh, other cases. And you can change this A1. Uh, and so that's the difference between the three models we have. Uh, models, turbulence models, we have spalatal maras. The spalatal maras model was, set, was tailored, tailored fixed for aerodynamic flows, external aerodynamic flows. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's really tailored, each time was tailored to perform very well. It's very uh, efficient in uh, flows around wings and stuff like that. Uh, the standard K epsilon is a model for uh, high Reynolds. Uh, it's a high Reynolds model. Uh, of course, we talked about the fact that it's uh, all the all the uh, actually all the uh, K epsilon model are wall uh, sensitive. The standard K omega is not used uh, except for cases where uh, there is no free screen. The boundary layer connects between the two sides. And then there's the BSL, which is not written here, but uh, it exists. It could be used. Uh, sometimes it's even better than the SSD. Uh, here you see the, uh, it's the ANSYS uh, recommendation to use the realizable K epsilon. Uh, uh, which uses uh, realizability conditions for a stream variant in the shear. And uh, then there's the uh, Reynolds stress model, which is not an eddy viscosity model, meaning it's uh, not dependent on uh, the eddy viscosity. We simply uh, calculate the Reynolds stresses. The problem with this, uh, with the RSM, is that uh, it's uh, very stiff. Uh, it has uh, many uh, 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 unknowns. The numerical solution. The, uh, the advantage it has is that, as you ask hypothesis, uh, you get a connection between the shear stress. It's exactly like uh, when you calculate the, the shear stress at the wall. You say tau equals uh, minus uh, mu t times d what u dy, right? So, uh, uh, but actually, 
the 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 part of the uh, stress here the the gradient of velocity that we get here is uh, the symmetric part of the, uh, the, the the shear is the symmetric part of the uh, velocity gradient uh, tensor and the anti-symmetric part is the Uh, rotation so, um, with, uh, so that's what we do get uh, uh, but uh, again it's, uh, usually it's not worth it what is uh, a new model that is used today now in fluent is called the uh, explicit algebraic uh, Reynolds stress model uh, which uh, actually uses a non-linear uh, eddy viscosity uh, assumption, and such, and, and as such, it uh, actually uh, uh, takes into account stuff like uh, uh, rotation. Okay, now we're done with this. Let's do a new share. This is so. Okay, here you can see how, how the truncation error actually works. You can see how this delta y here. How, if you if you get tetra, uh, you can never get uh, the uh, flow aligned with the tetra because tetra changes orientation all the time. And uh, error is uh, uh, what's the interesting thing okay now how do okay uh, uh, rule of thumb is have at least 15 uh, layers inside the boundary layer okay uh, at least 15 sometimes uh, in cases like uh, where they have to have uh, very low margins uh, they use even 40 layers uh, it's uh, very important but the way to check the uh, boundary layer, uh, uh, covering all the boundary layer, is using the eddy viscosity ratio. It's very important. Not the velocity. I mean, the velocity could uh, uh, lead you astray. It could look like you cover the boundary layer, but you don't. The eddy viscosity is maximum around the middle of the boundary layer. Yeah. What do you mean only is a tropic component? Is a tropic component of what? Uh, Oh, okay. uh, I'm not sure I understood, but okay. Uh, topology of mesh. Topology of mesh is very important. Uh, how's that? This is something very interesting. Uh, um, what you see here is a cubic uh, lid-driven cavity problem. Uh, if uh, someone doesn't understand, it's a cube. The upper, the upper uh, phase is moving with a certain velocity, and we'd expect that 
this cubic lid cover, uh, driven cavity problem would be uh, tailor made for hex mesh, right? Because it's it's a cube. But uh, as it appears, uh, because of the uh, recirculation areas, uh, polyhedra mesh uh, performs better than hex mesh in this case. So uh, sometimes uh, things like that should be taken into account. Okay. The last part I want to talk about uh, is the, the mostly important for the uh, verification process is uh, solving the equations right. Verification is the process of determining that the model implementation accurately represents the developer conceptual description of the model to substitute the model. <clears throat> or simply put, solving the equation, pose the problem, uh, if, you, if, if you don't code the equation, uh, uh, the sufficiently accurate, uh, that shouldn't pose a problem. Uh, but uh, one issue with verification could be, again, uh, the fact that you can't get a uh, grid convergence. Uh, so maybe you're using uh, low order to low order of uh, uh, discretization scheme. But in most in most softwares, we use second order up wind, so there's no problem with that. Uh, the issue of uh, grid convergence, you can see here one that I did uh, for a certain problem. Uh, it's simply taking and uh, uh, refining the mesh and uh, getting kind of uh, band uh, a few considerations uh, of particular importance to uh, uh, EVMs EVMs I mean a viscosity model the choice of turbulence model may impact the effectiveness of the procedure for example an incorrect uh, it is incorrect to refine a high Reynolds wall sensitive model such as the K epsilon. I mean, you want to do a grid convergence for the K epsilon model, standard K epsilon. You cannot do that because uh, you cannot enter the viscous sub layer. <laughs> Uh, generally speaking, the most forward flows are concerned. It is most important to assess the impact of the mesh refinement in locations of high gradients. Okay. I mean, uh, uh, where the flow doesn't change. Um, uh, so that's uh, okay. <clears throat> we always should remember this this procedure of uh, uh, grid convergence, which which means that we have uh, verified the equations. A verification procedure is, is is it is necessary, but it is not sufficient. Of course, if you didn't solve the right physical model. Problem, then although uh, grid convergence the, didn't describe the right phenomenon. Here comes the invalidation. Validation is solving the right equations. Okay, uh, solving the equations right.
that you can get by grid convergence. Here it's solving the right equations. Uh, the formal uh, uh, definition of validation, meaning the degree of which a model is an uh, meaning valid, invalid model that represents the physics. Okay, we usually do this how? By experiment. process yes uh, it's, it's, uh, it's 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 uh, very easy to say that uh, I got a different uh, it's, it's 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 not so easy to conduct an experiment that validates uh, CFD Okay, uh, measurements are very hard. They are uh, uh, measuring devices have their own accuracy. You cannot put them, they interrupt the flow. They, they, it's, it's not always that uh, uh, it's uh, documented. It's, it's very hard to validate them. Uh, 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 CFD by an experiment. It's not as easy as it uh, seems. My voice is breaking. Okay, um, that's another thing, uh, <laughs> let's be realistic, uh, due to the knowledge gap, time overhead, limited resources, conducting validation experiments uh, is uh, rarely done. Okay, uh, like uh, measuring the temperature over a component is not a validation of a simulation. Um, okay, that's enough for me. Here you see a problem which is uh, very interesting, uh, where EVMs fail totally because of the the because of the uh, inability to account for rotation. Uh, what happens is that the flow actually, uh, it actually, uh, uh, that's the Stanford diffuser. It actually shows something different. Look how it's, it's supposed to be. And it actually flips it. The that uh, EVM model actually flips it. It's so wrong that uh, 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 it's horrible. Okay, near wall behavior. We've talked about it. Uh, standard wall functions, scalable wall functions is the option that. Uh, in the case of fluence, it's eleven point one one one. Two five, I don't know, but uh, scalable wall function exists in every uh, uh, um, uh, vendor. It means that it decides whether either you're in the log layer or you're in the uh, viscous sub layer. Non equilibrium wall functions uh, for cases where we have uh, jets uh, or impediment. Um, Low Reynolds models they are problematic. Okay, I think that's it for this. Now let's look a little bit about on machine. 
the sound meshing matrix. Uh, the difference between structured meshing and unstructured meshing uh, is uh, should be. I mean, uh, ISIM is not structured meshing. Okay, structured meshing means that you can take every uh, point from the physical domain and throw it inside like a cube-like uh, computational domain, solve the problem here, and transfer it here. Unstructured mesh is easier to build, but uh, uh, and when the complexity of the geometry is very high, then there's no other choice. Uh, Convergence time, of course, uh, if you can do a structured match, is a lot more efficient. Tet versus poly, we've talked about before. Okay, here you see again uh, the issue of uh, hex mesh when the flow is aligned and when the flow and trim and uh, tetra mesh. Uh, you see that it, uh, uh, because the flow is not aligned with the faces, you have the truncation error, the numerical diffusion, and the numerical dispersion, of course, and other. But uh, when the flow is not aligned with the cell face, then it looks quite the same. Okay, so there's no uh, real difference. Fully automated workflow versus practitioner control improved algorithm machine. What do you prefer? Do you prefer the role? And someone said the workflow is awesome. Maybe one day you will have uh, like a, a fully automated uh, mesh. Uh, verified and uh, optimized, and uh, I mean, that's the, uh, I think that in the very near future, uh, with machine learning, and uh, it's going to happen. Uh, the the man in the loop, the nonetheless, that most people. Uh, uh, simulate but don't really understand non phenomenology and not the CFD itself. I mean, uh, what the turbulence model means, what uh, what uh, the phenomenology means. Simply sentence and they push it. Uh, it happens a lot. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of ashamed to say that uh, I get I get with people that I would be uh, uh, CFD lab ma uh, professors at colleges in my country. And they, they, they don't even six of the CFD bit. Yes. Someone has any question? Can you hear me? Am I talking to myself? Yeah. Okay. Why do you keep asking me the uh, chat? You can talk. You can talk, my friends. How do you think sounds like a poor connection? Okay, uh, any specific questions that you have uh, before we move here? Okay, higher order methods. 
Uh, I think they're going to enter some, some software already use them. Uh, one of them is uh, this one, LCS Fast. Most of you know, it. I hope so. Uh, so uh, this is a Q&A kind of uh, thing. Uh, why are second order app wings so dominating today? Well, some of this goes to inertia. There has been uh, so much effort in the past decades to advance robustness and efficiency of second order numerical models that it seems optimal for most applications. Uh, but it doesn't mean that, that we could not uh, uh, gain a lot of knowledge by using higher order uh, models, uh, especially the, uh, as we saw, the uh, numerical dissipation and numerical uh, uh, dispersion, uh, um, which could be much reduced. Uh, higher order models, uh, higher order mass, uh, discretization don't also also don't have to be more expensive because uh, you can then use uh, larger mesh. I mean, uh, you don't have to have the mesh as refined. Uh, okay. There is a thing with uh, 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 which is now very hot, which is uh, age adaptation versus P adaptation. Uh, I mean, adapting the mesh age adaptation, you all know, is like uh, taking the mesh and refining it, okay? And P adaptation is a uh, different kind of adaptations, is taking the polynome and raising it, okay? To go to a higher order mesh. Uh, discretization and uh, play between the two should, uh, should is something that is really uh, working on. Nonetheless, that uh, uh, when we are talking about large eddy simulations and uh, and especially DNS, uh, higher order methods are uh, become are becoming quite essential. Uh, because the, especially at, uh, at, uh, at the area between the subread scale, the, the SGS and the uh, resolved scale, and exactly where the filter cuts, over there uh, we get uh, uh, large errors because of uh, non-commutative non uh, uh, operations that we do. Okay, so uh, we're kind of through with the, with the, uh, it's uh, already 11 past the time we should be done. So any, any questions? Specific questions, maybe about, uh, Maybe I didn't cover any, some kind of issue. Yes. Again, I, I, I'm not sure I understood the question. A square cross section, a square cross, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so uh, uh, when you have a square cross section, I mean, uh, what you're going to have is uh, like uh, uh, recirculation areas in the, uh, in the corners, yes. So, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm not going to tell you uh, uh, what to uh, try exactly, but uh, over there, the explicit algebraic, uh, and I'm going to show you also uh, now the 
specifically something very interesting, uh, which is here. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, the option of the, I don't know which, which software do you use? Which software? Okay, so, okay, so, uh, so uh, first of all, you have the explicit algebraic uh, uh, Reynolds press model which uh, in application containing uh, rectangular corners like a rectangular channel, exactly what you asked. Uh, uh, the was hypothesis uh, would not do, the linear one would not do, and here you see uh, the exact problem you were talking about, okay? This is a DNS, okay? Oh, you can see that page. Okay, because I didn't share it. I'm stupid. Uh, stupid me. Share. Now you can see, right? Exactly. Okay, so uh, the anti, as I said before, when we are talking about uh, 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 the Bosinesk hypothesis, uh, we have this uh, du dx, we have the uh, shear, but we are not, we, 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 we are taking out of the, uh, uh, out of the Reynolds stresses, what is the rotation, which is the, the anti-symmetric part of the uh, uh, velocity gradient tensor. That's a problem exactly in those cases you were talking about. Uh, here you see a square duct, okay? Here you see a DNS, a direct numerical simulation. Of course, uh, it's correct. Uh, assume that. Here you see what a linear stress strain relationship would do, which means. Uh, absolutely uh, bullshit and here you see a non-linear uh, stress strain relation uh, you can see the secondary flows it's you know, maybe on dns like but you can still see the secondary flows it's even not uh, uh, turbulent content it's it's still we're still talking about uh, reynolds average navier stokes Okay, but with a nonlinear stress strain term. Okay, so you have this in Gecko, but you also have this in the EARSM. Okay, the EARSM, the explicit algebraic uh, Reynolds stress model, uh, which is, uh, you can also use an RSM model. But the ERSM is advantageous, uh, advantageous uh, in the fact that it's, it's, uh, it's not as stiff, okay? It's, uh, uh, stiffness is a problem, which means that uh, uh, numerical stiffness may cause conver uh, divergence very quickly. It's very hard to, to because of that, to solve problems with uh, Reynolds stress models. Uh, so either use the EARSM, or you can use a uh, nonlinear strain, uh, strain, uh, stress strain relationship in Gecko. You have this option. No, no. Curvature correction? No, no. The curvature correction would do for cases like uh like when here this is what the curvature correction would do okay and that's exactly what the curvature correction would do it would do give you better result in a u term but it will not it will never give you uh uh the the, the, the reason is that the stresses cannot 
are, are too strong. They penetrate the, the, in, in the linear stress strain relationship, the stresses penetrate too strongly to the uh, corners. That's why you don't get it recirculation thing. Okay? That's, that's the issue that you have. Uh, the simple fact that the stress penetrates the corner. It doesn't allow for this uh, to happen. So no, uh, you cannot use the... Uh, uh, the curvature correction is actually based on uh, the same uh, curvature correction which is in Spalatal Maras model. It's the, it's the sure Spalart uh, curvature correction. And uh, it's kind of, you know, Never, not anything more than that. The problem with the Gecko model that uh, they didn't give and they will not give uh, any numbers for it. So right now you can mostly use it either you explore it by yourself or you can use it either as a K epsilon realizable or as a K omega SSD. And you can add uh, stuff like, uh, you know, uh, what you see here, but, but then, uh, I mean, it's not really there yet. Any other questions? Mm hmm? Okay, uh, here you see uh, uh, some kind of uh, example where the, we said the K-epsilon delays uh, uh, separation. In this case, it doesn't even give a separation. Okay, uh, you see that the SSD model uh, shows the uh, separation. In the K-Epsilon, it doesn't exist at all. Uh, so that's one of the problems that uh, the K-Epsilon has. Here, on the other side, uh, it is shown that uh, for it's, it's, uh, it's actually a non-axisymmetric jet flow using the K-Epsilon model. Actually, uh, and it was found that uh, for specific jet flows, uh, the K epsilon gives better results uh, than the K omega SSD. Why? Because. Okay. Uh, any other questions regarding solvers, regarding discretizations, regarding turbulence models? Any questions regarding uh, LES or uh, something else? Yeah, um, I have. Uh, hello, everyone. Yeah, so I have the question. I, I think it's a very basic question about what's the difference between LES and RANS. Oh, in Reynolds average Navier Stokes, what you do is you decompose to the flow to an average velocity and a perturbative velocity. And you actually model all the turbulence. All the turbulence is modeled. What you do in LES is uh, you resolve the, the mesh until some uh, ideally, to the Kolmogorov scale, then you'll have a direct numerical simulation. But because you could don't have this kind of uh, uh, computer resources, 
then you actually put a low pass filter on the equations, okay? So then you have uh, uh, resolved scales, okay? Resolved scales until you get to some level where there is a subgrid scale, which is a model also. And uh, the funniest thing is that when we talk about two equation models, we say they are closed, right? Remember, uh, they are closed because we don't need to guess anything. Do we have two uh, 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 equations, uh, uh, two uh, transport equations? LES is not closed because you have to guess the size of the filter. You have to decide where to put the filter. Okay? So, uh, but the difference is that in LES, uh, uh, we uh, model some of the turbulence, which is resolved by the mesh. And we assume that the model that we cannot resolve is representing the dissipation until the Kolmogorov scale. But uh, every large ID simulation uh, kind has different uh, properties. Some of them uh, that, that actually large ID simulation is even uh, older and, and uh, deeper in theory than uh, Reynolds average Navier Stokes. Uh, large ID simulation started with, with they started working on large ID simulation in the 50s and uh, and uh, runs only opened in the 70s with the Imperial College of London and like Johnson London. Uh, so that's the difference between large ID simulation and uh, Reynolds average and the Bear Stokes equations. Uh, and it's a huge difference because it means that in large eddy simulation you have turbulent content until uh, some level, of course. But you have turbulent content. Uh, in in Reynolds average Navier Stokes, you don't have any turbulent content. All the turbulent content is inside the model. Uh, and that's a big difference. Uh, but uh, as uh, Spallat uh, 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 said and assumed, uh, we wouldn't be able, w w the problem is with large eddy simulation is the near wall area. Uh, when, you, when we use uh, large eddy simulation, the area near the wall where we have uh, solid boundaries uh, is uh, probably 95% of the mesh. So we can't really solve a lot of problems, uh, world bounded less. Uh, that's why I said in the beginning that combustion, which, uh, which actually the flame is away from the wall, is gaining a lot of, uh, 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 you know, uh, adaptive wind because of uh, the, the option to explore the turbulence contents of the kinetics inside the flame. Um, uh, as Pollard said, we wouldn't be able to do a complete airplane uh, with large eddy simulation uh, at least until 2070. Uh, we have other methods which are called hybrid methods, which means that uh, some of them are like detached eddy simulation, uh, where we switch between uh, Reynolds average Napier Stokes near the wall and then large eddy simulation all over the away from the wall. Uh, but they have their own problems because connecting runs without any turbulent content and uh, large eddy simulation with turbulent content is uh, proved to be that's what called um, what's called the gray area it's uh, proved to be very problematic uh, what is gaining a little bit uh, wind is uh, what's called wm less uh, 
uh, which means that you put a small uh, layer of uh, Reynolds average in Abiastos near the wall and uh, on all the zones without dependency of, uh, of, the, of the mesh at all. And uh, you do larger dissimulation everywhere, everywhere else. Uh, but uh, again, uh, hybrid, hybrid, uh, hybrid uh, methods kind of suffer from, uh, there, there are two kinds of them. One of them is the zonal method, where we, we decide uh, uh, a priori where the last zone is going to be and where the run zone is going to be. And one of them is the monolithic, like the detached eddy simulation. When we get to a, a, le a level of mesh which is refined enough, it switches to larger eddy simulation and then back to... When it's not refined enough, it switches back to Reynolds average Navier-Stokes in one equation, uh, like the Spallot and Maras equation or the K-omega equation, in the case of uh, 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 fluent. But uh, they suffer from a lot of problems. That's why you see, uh, if someone of you read my detached eddy simulation, uh, uh, there is a detached eddy simulation shielded detached the dissimulation, improved chill the detached the dissimulation, and uh, it still goes on, but uh, uh, still unresolved. Still unresolved because uh, the problem of transferring, uh, especially transferring from uh, runs to larger dissimulation. I mean, you don't don't have any turbulent content, you model all the turbulence and then suddenly you need to uh, uh, have some turbulent content inside the larger dissimulation uh, zone. Uh, one way to overcome this is using the scale adaptive simulation model, uh, if you heard of it. Have you heard of it? Yeah, is it the mesh adaptive or? Another thing. The scale adaptive simulation model, uh, I have here, uh, I have here, uh, scale adaptive understanding, second generation runs each one. Okay. It works. It work. Yeah. Okay. Uh, scale resolving simulations and uh, blah 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 blah. Neurons less scale adaptive simulation. What it does is uh, simply it uh, it uses uh, it's it's a kind of formulation that uses the. Uh, some kind of approach which allows not for for it is not to unite in a, a specific shear layer uh, width. Okay, what does happen always with runs? Okay, it it, uh, it 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 always goes to the width of the shear layer, and then you get some turbulent content. You see it here. So it can be used as, uh, as uh, 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 it was offered as uh, a way to use it for uh, the transfer of uh, from uh, runs to less in hybrid uh, simulations. To tell you the truth, I think uh, this method is uh, uh, bullshit. It, it, it depends on the von Karman length scale, uh, which does this, this uh, uh, which prevents from the uh, the the eddies to uh, reunite till the size of the shear layer. But uh, I don't think it means anything. I mean, there is no, there is no uh, uh, 
proof that the the content that is shown here, I mean, is uh, something that is uh, either uh, like large dissimulation or something like that. Um, and again, uh, okay, there's uh, here, you see, uh, there's another method called pans where you, uh, what you do is uh, you partially average the Navier-Stokes equation. And for both of them, there is suggestions to use them in uh, what's called zonal hybrid runs less. I mean, you have a zone which is runs, you have a zone which is less. And then perhaps if you use one of these methods, either the partially the average Navier-Stokes or the scale adaptive simulation, you can transfer some turbulent content to the larger dissimulation area. But uh, it's uh, we're still not there. Uh, still not there. Uh, and uh, the near wall area uh, has demands like uh, for larger dissimulation like uh, DNS almost. Uh, you can stretch the cells, you need to get to the Kolmogorov scales and uh, it's not possible. Okay, I think we're uh, going to, uh, if you don't have any other questions, Someone? Oh, okay, so thank you very much. Uh, it's not so obvious that you uh, that you took the time to to uh, join me here. Uh, my next time is going to be spent more on uh, uh, large eddy simulation and uh, uh, a little bit uh, uh, hybrid simulations uh, because of the complexity of these topics uh, I suggest I mean uh, it, uh, thinking about uh, joining um, Thank you very much for joining. And, uh, and uh, thank bye -bye. you very much. Bye. Have a nice night.